Welcome to our video on sizing steel wide flange beams from tables. This is section 6.3 in the reading material and after this you see the letter A because we've chosen to break this material up into three different uh, video chunks which we're labeling A, B, and C. This particular one is focusing on using Excel as a load preprocessor and to organize the sequencing, recording, and presentation of the sizing decisions that we're going to make during this procedure. In a, a typical beam, we are typically concerned about shear capacity, moment capacity, and stiffness. And for wood and concrete, we have to account for all three of those in a very careful way. In the case of wood, we have a shear occurring along a weak shear plane, so we see a failure mode of this sort. In concrete, we have tension occurring on planes at an angle near the end, so there will be cracks in the beam that occur there along those tensile, tensely stressed surfaces. Um, so shear capacity has to be addressed. We also have uh, the potential for moment failure, which might involve tearing of the fibers on the bottom of the st structure or compressive failure on the top. And then there's the issue of stiffness, which has to do uh, mainly with serviceability. Um, if a floor beam, for example, is not stiff enough, it will be perceived as weak. Even though it may not be weak, it will just not be stiff enough. So there's a perceptual issue that we have to account for. And also, in the movement of beams, um, we may have to worry about partitions being crushed. And in roofing situations, we might have to worry about a phenomenon called ponding, where uh, an initial load of rain may cause some deflection of the roof, which creates a kind of bowl-like shape. And that means more water accumulates and eventually, if the bowl becomes deep enough as a result of the lack of stiffness, then the beam actually fails catastrophically. In the case of steel, which is very strong in shear, we rarely have a shear failure. Therefore, in the sizing of steel beams, we are going to focus on moment capacity and stiffness. And right now, because of the usual sequence in which we present these, shear capacity, moment capacity, and stiffness, We've shown moment capacity on the left and stiffness on the right. It turns out, though, for reasons that will become clear after a while, we typically size a steel beam for stiffness first and then for moment capacity. And it really doesn't make any difference which you do first because you have to satisfy both of those. Uh, so you pick whichever one makes the sizing procedure simpler. And in the case of of steel beams that is definitely to size for stiffness first and then for moment. The first thing that we have to do in sizing any beam is to figure out what the load is on that beam and certainly we need to know uh, area distributed dead load and area distributed live load but we also need to know how much floor area is being supported by that beam. So here we have a diagram of a 30 by 30 uh, column grid. So from this column to that one is 30 feet, and then 30 feet again to that one, and it's 30 feet to this column, and 30 feet down to that column. So we have uh, a total of four bays here. Each bay is 30 feet by 30 feet. Uh, we have a perimeter girder here, which we can also call a a, a perimeter a primary beam. Then we have an interior girder here and here. And then all the beams going in this direction are joist and the floor decking would be spanning in this direction from joist to joist. So uh, the spacing that's been selected in this particular diagram between joist is five feet. So we have six of these five foot spaces that add up to a total of 30 feet between the columns. In the case of a joist, it supports halfway to the next joist on this side and halfway to the next joist on that side. So in other words, it supports a swash of floor that is five feet wide, and of course it has to support all the way from one girder to the other. But the width of the strip of floor it's supporting is five feet. 
Now if we looked at one of these beams at the end here, we would say it only supports half as much. But we're not even going to get into the behavior of that beam right now because that beam typically is not only supporting some floor load, but it has special um, wall loads that it also has to support. And we don't really know enough about uh, the particular design of the building at this point to get into that. So we're going to focus on the design of one of these interior joists, which is supporting floor on each side. Uh, the perimeter girder has to support the, the portion of floor that takes it halfway over to the next girder. So in other words, it's supporting a swash of floor that's 15 feet wide. And finally, the interior girder is supporting floor halfway over to the next girder on this side, or in other words, to this line, and halfway over to the perimeter girder on this side, or in other words, out as far as that line right there. So the total width that's being supported is 30 feet. So this distance right here is what's being supported by this interior girder and that interior girder. Now we're going to go into Excel and do some computations to take us from area distributed load to line load along the beam, which is what we always have to find in order to size a beam. But before we go into Excel, there's a general warning that I want to give, and I will repeat this on a number of occasions. Excel will not get your units correct for you. So don't just start writing an equation into Excel. You really want to carefully write it out longhand and make sure that you have tracked all your units and converted all your units so that they are finally consistent in the final answer. Um, and so before you go into Excel, write out all of your equations, at least one example of each type so that you know what all the conversions factor factors are. Um, at this particular point, an example of what we want is to keep straight that you're expressing everything in consistent units. If you're using kips for force, then make sure that you convert all values expressed in pounds to appropriate values expressed in kips before you proceed with your computations. For length um, measurements you will always use feet and inches for cross-sectional measurements. So down here we have an equation that takes an example. The line distributed load along the beam is the area distributed load times the width of the swash of floor that's being supported. So in the case of the joist, we might have 20 pounds a square foot of dead load. We said we have a five foot width of floor. When we multiply those together, one of these feet cancels out, this foot cancels out with one of these, and we're left in pounds per foot. And then the 20 times five is 100. So we have 100 pounds per foot, but the first thing we're always going to do is to convert that to kips. So we'll take that 100 pounds a square foot, and we'll multiply by a kip per thousand square feet, so we get 0.1 kips per foot. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to put this kips, one kip, in fact I'm going to do this again. I'm going to click on this and write it out in detail that the conversion factor is one kip per 1,000 pounds and I'm putting it in the square brackets to indicate that it's a conversion. So we're going to now go to our Excel spreadsheet, which I have shown here in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to convert to the actual spreadsheet so that we can see um, the formulas that are inserted. So we've titled this spreadsheet uh, Sizing Steel Beams from Tables. Um, and in this example, we're taking the 30 foot by 30 foot grid. So the joist is spanning 30 feet and the girder is spanning 30 feet. And you'll notice that we've put in the grade of steel FY equals 50 KSI. Um, this grade could be changed. So in the spreadsheet, I've put this 50 in, in blue and that is customarily the way I designate an input variable that can be changed in the template. So when we come down in the table, I'm going to just scroll down a little bit. And by the way, I'm going to point out here that we've got a load calculation portion, a sizing for stiffness. And if I scroll over, we see we also have a sizing for moment strength. 
So there's a sequence that we're going to go through here, and we have a little video for each one of these. So we're going to focus right now on this portion of this spreadsheet, and then in the next video we'll focus on sizing for stiffness, and finally we'll go over and focus on sizing for moment capacity. So for right now we're looking at this part of the table, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit here so that we can get at least all of our roof beams. So you'll notice I got roof joist, single loaded roof girder, double loaded roof girder, and by the way, this is a little better language than saying this is a perimeter girder and this is an interior girder, but we're using this terminology interchangeably. So an interior girder will be a double loaded girder. Everything here has to do with roofs for these three beams. The span of the joist is 30 feet, the span of the girder is 30 feet, but this is a template uh, so I can go in and change these numbers to uh, deal with any other particular span condition. Um, in this case, the spacing of the, uh, of the beams is 5 feet, and in some spreadsheets that I'll show you later on, I've designated the number of spaces and so you type in the number of spaces and then it calculates the spacing between the joists. But in this case, uh, we've kept the spreadsheet simple and you just decide for yourself what spacing the joists ought to be and you plug that number in here. Um, you'll notice by the way down here there's a 15 and that 15 is not blue, it's black, which means it's not an input, it's something that's calculated. And in this case, the swash of roof or the spacing or the width of floor that's supported by the joist is um, 15 feet, which turns out to be, we've written in B28 over 2. So we go here and we say, this is B28, which is the length of the roof joist. So that's really nice to put that there, because if we go change the roof joist length, this number gets corrected automatically. You'll also notice here, we've got um, 30, which is just B28 over 1, or in other words, it's this number um, because this double loaded roof girder basically supports uh, a distance from side to side that's equal to the length of the roof joist. Uh, you'll notice in here we've put 20 pounds a square foot for dead load, 20 pounds a square foot for live load, and that's the same for all the beams that are supporting the roof because the area distributed load for all of them is uh, 20 pounds a square foot. Now we've calculated here line distributed load, dead load, W dead, in kips per foot. And this is the formula. This is a formula that we wrote in earlier and that we're repeating here, except in this case we've designated it specifically as dead. So the line distributed dead load is equal to the area distributed dead load times the spacing for the joist. And then there's a conversion here that converts it from pounds to kips. So whatever number that we get there, we divide by a thousand. Now, it's really important to remember that because if you proceed and you forget that, you're off by a factor of a thousand. And a factor of a thousand is something to be seriously worried about. Uh, it will give you a heart attack when you get a number like that. So this number, by the way, we'll click on this cell and you'll see it says C28 times D28. So that's the spacing C times the area distributed load. So I kind of reverse them in this formula. Uh, if P came first, it would be D28 and then times C28. But since multiplication is commutative, we don't care what order those come in. So this is P times S divided by a thousand and we get 0.1. And likewise we get that for W live. It's a similar formula. Uh, the spacing is the same. P live it turns out is the same as P dead. So this number turns out to be the same. So it's this spacing C28 times E28 divided by a thousand. So when we come down here we see that um, the line distributed dead load for the single loaded roof girder is going to be 15, which is C31, times D31, which is 20 pounds a square foot. So it's 15 times 20, which is 300, but then we divide by 1,000 and we get 0.3. And the numbers are similar because this live load is equal to that dead load. We get a similar number here. 
And then for the double loaded girder, when we click on this cell, we see it's C34 times D34. So it's this times that, and all the conversions get done. So we end up with 30 times 20, which is 600, divided by 1,000 to get it into kips per foot. And likewise, this is C34 times E34, which is P live. Now, we can uh, scroll down in the spreadsheet and I hope that we can see all this at once, maybe not all of it, but we repeat all that above for the floor joist, the single loaded floor girders, and the double loaded floor girders. And the only thing that's changed here is the loads where we have a dead load of 53 pounds a square foot and a live load of 100 pounds a square foot. So when I click on this, I get C37 times D37. That's the spacing times the dead load. And then I have to divide that number. That's 265 when I multiply all that together. Then I divide by 1,000 to get it in kips per foot. The uh, live load is C37, which is 5 times E37, which is 100, or in other words, 500 pounds per foot or 0.5 kips per foot. Down here, we just changed to C40, which is 15 times D40, which is 53. And so you can go through and study all those equations. Uh, this is C40 times E40. This is C43 times D43. And then this formula is C43 times E43. So these are the numbers we calculate. Now, when we go from tables, we're going to use all these highlighted numbers. For the joist, we're going to use these two numbers on the roof. And for the floor joist, we're going to use these two numbers. And for the single loaded roof girders, we're going to use these two numbers. Um, if we were working in a computer program like multi-frame, we would only use these yellow cells because in multi-frame it automatically transfers any load on the joist, including the self-weight of the joist, to the girder that's supporting it. In our calculations, though, we don't have multi-frame to keep track of that for us, so we're going to have to separately size these girders, and that means we have to know the, lo the loads on them. And in fact, we're not only going to need to know the loads from the dead load of the decking and the live load of people walking on the floor, but we're also going to have to account for the dead weight of the joist, which these um, girders also have to support in terms of having adequate strength. So that concludes our video on sizing uh, the uh, steel wide flange beams, uh, where we're focusing on using Excel uh, for these functions as a load preprocessor and organizing the sequencing, recording, and presentation of these sizing decisions.